What Will Be Here, Episode 7, Ignition Failure. Content warnings for this episode include swearing. See the show notes for more details and a link to the transcript. This week has been a real mixed bag. Things with Dane are going great, but things with the rocket, not so much. Good things first, though. Dane and Shuri talked it out after their... argument the other week. Normally I wouldn't bring it up, but I think the mic caught some of it, and I wouldn't want to leave you on a cliffhanger, dear listener. That was exciting, though a little scary, too. I thought Shuri was going to start throwing punches. It didn't come to that, thankfully. But, yeah, things have been going really well. We actually snuck off for a date last weekend. Um, don't tell Shuri that. We went to Rising Auras, which is this cliff nearby that looks over the nuclear plant. That doesn't sound romantic, but it was. When you go there at night, you can see the faint glow of the ground. And when the sky is clear, you can sometimes catch a star or two. We sat there and talked for hours... It was a bright spot in this otherwise not-so-great time. Speaking of... The rocket. We're having trouble getting fuel for it. This was always going to be the hardest part, and, well, it definitely is. (laughs) Not that the other parts have been easy. There's no way I could have done this alone. That was my plan from the start. I don't think I've ever said, but... Yeah, I was going to try to launch to deep space myself. That was pretty naive. (laughs) I don't think I could ever reach a geosynchronous orbit working by myself, let alone get completely out of the solar system. I'm glad I'm not the only one doing this. I've learned so much from everyone. Not just about rocket science and building things, but like, about everything. I didn't think I lived that sheltered of a life, but it turns out I was pretty sheltered. Heck, probably still am. I've learned a lot about Savannah. I was always taught growing up that they were this great hope for society, a beacon of progress and productivity. I had kind of figured out that it was all propaganda by the time I was in college, but I never realized how straight-up evil they are. My parents work there. I could have a job there if I wanted to, and I used to. The people who work there aren't all bad. But now I just... (sighs) This was my idea. To send a record out to the stars. I always thought of this as more of a fun time capsule, but I think... I think this is the end. Every day I realize more and more that it might actually be humanity's final message. In the past, getting stuck on something like this, something like not getting fuel, might mean giving up. Sure, this is the biggest rocket I've ever built, and sure, I really don't want to give up on it because we've done so much work... K would bring up the sunk cost fallacy here. But I don't want to give up, because this is important. This has become so important to me. I've put so much at risk making this. It goes beyond the normal slap-on-the-wrist consequences for getting caught. When I was in college, I got caught doing a launch in an abandoned airfield, and all they did was confiscate what was left of my gear and tell my parents. I sure learned a thing or two about remote launches from that experience. (laughs) They never caught me again. (laughs) That was the first rocket of mine that made it out of Earth's atmosphere. And now, we're going into deep space. I hate that I couldn't make the fuel we need. It wasn't exactly my job. Shuri has some ways to get it, but it is my thing. I've done it before, you know. I guess I can't beat myself up for not being able to make a new type of fuel on such a massive scale, but I'm still disappointed. I can't help but feel like a failure. For this, and so many other reasons. Uh, This is getting negative. I'm gonna stop recording now. (sighs) Humans have an inexplicable ability to take something that is already extremely dangerous and find a way to make it even more dangerous. And then we strap ourselves to it with minimal safety measures and just go. Take, for instance, the humble airplane. 
When first created, it was just a plank with some wings attached. The most it could do was fall with style. And some asshole decided, hey, what if we attach propellers and a steam engine to it? Oh, sure, who cares that my passenger died? It flies! And fast forward a few hundred years, a few thousand improvements, and we have those fancy ramjets and scramjets and Savannah-owned and AI-operated turbo-rocket jets. God knows how many people those kill per year with the amount of nitrous oxide exhaust they produce. <clears throat> Nowadays, everything is powered by a motor of some sorts. Bikes, rollerblades, horses, and not to mention the different ways Savannah's managed to shove a rocket onto something and call it science. Did you know race cars weren't always rocket propelled? I know. Crazy, right? Apparently, back when NASCAR was created in the mid-1900s, they just used regular, old, crude-oiled cars. Those original cars could only get up to 300 miles per hour. <laughs> Lovably low, if you ask me. Now, then about 50 or 60 years ago, some um, NASCAR folks got it in their heads that they could probably get going a lot faster if they just strapped rockets to a car instead. Now those babies can get up to a thousand miles per hour. They also can't call it the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing anymore since they aren't technically stock cars anymore, so they went ahead and formed their own league. It's the, um, the National Association for Rocket Car Racing now, or NARC Racing. I have a friend who's been working with NARC since the beginning. Z specializes in making sure new engines don't just explode the moment the race starts. That, and making sure the racer actually stays in the car and isn't just catapulted from the car at a million miles an hour. Zir... Zir smart. Practical. Always have been. I used to work in Zir's shop when I was younger. Way too young to actually be working there, but... Z taught me a lot about how machines work. Yeah. Things these days weren't built to last. Savannah's the king of planned obsolescence, among other things. But they're also extremely good at making it impossible to take things apart without specialized Savannah tools. Unless you know what you're doing. Take this hand mixer, for instance. This little guy, who belongs to no one in particular, was made by Savannah. It's got all the right parts, technically. Except the motor is programmed to run at a slightly higher temperature than it should. That way, it overheats more often, which can lead to short circuits, which can fry the entire system and ruin everything. Oh, just from one little part. Z, um, Kiko, Z were supposed to help me acquire fuel for us to use for this rocket. You know, something to help us get off the ground. Unfortunately, Savannah, in all of their infinite wisdom, decided to give my dear friend Kiko a promotion. With zero warning. I didn't even find out until this morning. It's a good position, don't get me wrong. But that lovely little promotion also came with a transfer. Zero all the way upstate now. It's not very safe to transport all that fuel outside of town. What with the ongoing pandemic and the fact that we've been under a seemingly endless tornado watch since before I was born. Travel isn't an option for anyone, except those who can afford it. <sighs> All of this to say that I have failed due to some 
unplanned obsolescence. Hey, Kay, I... Is... Is that Armani's hand mixer? Uh, well, it was. Do they know you have their hand mixer? If they don't, they will soon enough. What did you... You know what? Never mind. Were you able to get in contact with your friend? Uh, yeah. About that... You ever think about how we're animals too? Biologically speaking. But something is fundamentally different about us. The difference is mostly mental, if you ask me. The way that we construct imaginary systems in societies and then abide by them. And it's our willingness to believe that these fake systems have an effect on the real world around us. Our belief in these systems is what makes us scared of things that don't really exist. I mean, not really. Like failure. Failure doesn't exist in nature's eyes, and instead hinges entirely on our belief that there is a particular way that a means should be achieved. That's one of those things that makes us human. Well, being afraid of concepts in general is a thing that makes us human. But the fear of failure especially is a byproduct of humanity. Every other creature is just going through the motions of existing. But we get caught up in our own imaginations. There's this mythical hero, Enkidu. He's a major character in the Epic of Gilgamesh, a Mesopotamian story that was written as early as 5,000 years ago from my time. And I can only imagine how long it's been from then to the time this message reaches anyone. Enkidu was this wild man, created by the goddess Aruru to defeat the king of Uruk, the eponymous Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was like 66% god, so he was super powerful and did a lot of messed up stuff to his subjects. Those subjects were fed up with him, so they prayed to the gods to do something. In response, Aruru created Enkidu to get Gilgamesh to stop being a total douche. But before he got to fighting Gilgamesh, and eventually becoming his bestie, he was just living in the woods. Running amok, doing whatever. Living the dream. But then, he was introduced to a temple prostitute, Shamhat. And he had sex with her for, like, a week. Next thing you know... Enkidu has his eyes opened to human society. He starts wearing clothes and eating human food. But he can't run as fast as he used to. And his animal friends are scared of him now. He gave up some of his wildness to be a little more... man. And he gets all the baggage that comes with it too. After some misbehaving, machismo, and murdering of deities, Enkidu was cursed by the gods to die young. Ugh. Cannot believe I let Kay take the standing mixer. If Enkidu hadn't been roped into humanity, this wouldn't have happened. And he wouldn't have encountered that undeniably human fear of concepts. In this case, it was the fear of death. Having to confront his newfound mortality seriously pisses him off. What a waste of time to get mixed up in all this humanity BS. It just doesn't matter. But at the same time, once you do subscribe to it, it starts to seem like the made-up human BS is responsible for everything that happens to you in life. Especially the bad things. And that's exactly what I mean. There's so much extra stuff that we worry about. All because we're thrust into this world with a bunch of made-up rules and parameters. And if you can't succeed within those parameters, if you fail, then it feels like there's no point in even existing. But... 
what I want to ask is what if failing isn't a total waste? In the most basic understanding of the world, right, success and by association failure, it doesn't exist at all. But what does undeniably exist is change. Maybe we shouldn't look at every failure as a step towards success, but instead see every attempt, whether it's success or failure, as a means for change. Change in ourselves, definitely, but also those around us. And if your ultimate goal was to change something all along, then maybe it doesn't matter what you did, or how you did it. Only that you did something. Ugh. Fucking... Finally. That's another idea surrounding the epic. After his best friend dies, Gilgamesh starts to come to terms with the fact that he too will pass away someday. This freaks him out and sends him on a journey to unlock the secret to obtaining immortality. Fast forward through a lot of still being a jerk and eventually some character development, and Gilgamesh has become a much better person. He also becomes a better king as a result. But he doesn't get his immortality. By the end of what we have of the story, Gilgamesh is definitely still going to die someday. However, it can be argued that Gilgamesh's growth into a competent and capable king did secure him some sort of immortality. For his actions, he's revered and deified after his death, and is still remembered, even 5,000 years in the future. And he is presumably now having his story told even further in the future to you, the listeners. He didn't achieve his goal, but he changed himself and his kingdom into something unforgettable, something that will never die. So did he really fail? This is all to say, you know, if this rocket doesn't make it into deep space, does that automatically make it devoid of worth? Does that mean that all this has been for nothing? I'm imagining all the scenarios, and the end doesn't look particularly good for any of us, no matter what happens. If the rocket succeeds, Savannah will still probably know who's responsible. We'll be buried. Realistically, only the three of us with established reputations topside might survive this, and considering who Jules' parents are, she just might make it out scot-free. Say the rocket fails. For some reason, the launch gets screwed up and we have this rocket that crashes or explodes topside. Or maybe even before it makes it out of the underground. Or what if the rocket never even takes off and Jules' track a mishap or something else lands us in hot water before we can launch? Again, we're not going to walk out of this unscathed. So the outcome is kind of the same either way, isn't it? Maybe that's true. Maybe it's all the same for us. But I hope that it will also be the same for everyone else. Not many people know about the rocket, of course, but rumours spread. People are observant down here. Sherry and Dane's mums definitely know that something's up. I run into neighbours outside of our HQ and they've asked what we're doing in here. I'm not telling them, but the fact that I'm keeping secrets probably tells them enough already. We're up to something we shouldn't be. And there's a reason Savannah quells dissent so quickly and thoroughly. It spreads. I'm hoping that whatever we do, whether we succeed or fail in this, it spreads. I hope it lights a fire in everyone that bears witness to it or even catches wind of it. I hope it reminds everyone that so much of what binds us doesn't matter. That we might as well do something that'll make us seem immortal, 
since we'll all die anyway. I couldn't get my share of fuel. I wanted to get it from my dad's aunt. She's a manager in a storage warehouse topside that serves high-profile clients. They keep a lot of client and order information very hush-hush, and it's pretty easy for her to make additions alongside big orders since everything is done mostly off the books and using burner accounts. But apparently, Savannah has been breathing down her neck ever since some faulty tech they received was traced back to her. Now isn't the time to do anything suspicious. Like order a shit ton of rocket fuel. So, maybe this is just my fear of failure talking, but I really hope that this rocket, success or failure, that it'll amount to something. It'll do something. Even if not what we'd originally intended. I guess what I'm trying to say is... Maybe the real success will come from the byproducts of what we make? <laughs> Maybe the real rocket was the change we made along the way. Hey, sorry, Armani. Uh, did you just make a really awful joke? Um, no. <laughs> she thinks so. Nope, they're my backup. That was an agreement, meow. Sure. It was. See? I think that was a disagreement, Meow. <laughs> Someone smells my Ravani. I don't think she cares unless you put, like, fish in there. Ew. I would never. Oh, thank fuck. I want to be first in line when you pop that baby out. And, hey, while I'm here, your fuel plans, can you give me an update? Uh, right. Um, let me just turn this off first. Dear friends, I'm so sorry for the abrupt absence, but I've recently been offered a position with Clear Sky Inc. This position offers me a number of rare opportunities in my field, and I hope to be back just after Christmas. I've already made arrangements with the building supervisors to have the apartment cleared out on the 18th. Please forward any packages to NINST 4703 Worrells Lane, Suite 43224. It's been a pleasure working with you all, but Savannah needs me elsewhere right now. Peter. What the hell, Pete? Six months away from your doctorate, and, and you just up and disappear to... Where even is the NINST? You spent how many years talking about how you want to move to eastern Mexico and get a position at Anahedora? We were freshmen, I think, and now you just can't refuse a position at some obscure Savannah subsidiary that makes... What? Food service film. Come on! A chemical engineer of your caliber should at least be able to demand an interview. Is this where we're at now? I have a pretty cut and dry meeting with you to get comparatively not that much rocket fuel, and Savannah just up and transplants you. Oh God, w was this my fault? D did Savannah piece something together and, and now this is their attempt to drive us into their arms? Oh, no, this is just how Savannah fucking operates. And, and we've got to do our best to work around them and their terrible... Terrible policies that don't give two shits about us, or, or the people we care for, or anyone, for that matter. <sighs> Why, you couldn't have called? You couldn't have called to say that you were leaving, or something. <sighs> How 
How is every development on this project setting us up to have horrible lives after this? We get raided. I lose a good friend. We try to get fuel. I lose a good friend. I'm not going to have any friends left soon. Am I even going to have anyone? Who's next? Shuri? Jules! For fuck's sake! You've already taken every other part of my life. Why not take my family too? Dane? Jules. I take it things didn't go so well? Peter's gone. Just plucked up and shipped off to who knows where for some obscure Savannah Shell Company. And all he leaves is a shitty note. It's been a pleasure working with you all, but Savannah needs me elsewhere right now. Give me a fucking break. Hmm. They didn't go with my idea? Listen, Dane, I know this is... Wait. What did you just say? It's nothing. Just a bit of wording that... You said my idea. Jules. Did... Did you rat us out? No. No, 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 Dane. I would never do something like that. Especially after how close I've already come to making this whole thing crash down around us. No, uh, m- my mom writes the transitional notes, that's all. I made a suggestion, and it seems like she tweaked it. The... the what, Jules? The transitional notes. You know, when Savannah has to move someone quickly, and they need them in a new office in a matter of hours. They leave a note in case there were standing meetings. And your mother writes these notes? Once a quarter, and then they get sent off to some robo-pen that makes a handwritten copy. <sighs> Jules, we have a name for that particular department of Savannah. Uh, what? We call them relocators. Well, it's a bit more complicated than yeah, that. Yeah, Jules, it is. Because I just remembered where Ninst is. Or was, I should say. Because it was in Ohio. You know, that state that isn't goddamn there anymore? People don't get relocated to Ohio for business reasons. Unless that reason is, they're disappearing. And it sure seems like your parents have a lot more to do with the off-book activities of everyone's favorite company that you've let on. Dane, it's not what you think. Then what is it, Jules? Because it sure sounds to me like your parents might have had a hand in making a very good friend of mine just disappear. Hell, you might have even told them what to write. Dane, I, I, I didn't... I didn't... I didn't know that that's what those were for. Oh, for crying out loud, Jules. Don't give me that crap. You can't have been living with someone in the relocation department for I don't know how many years and not have any idea that they're systematically plucking people up who might be a potential problem for them down the line. Was this whole thing even your idea, actually? Or did they just put you up to it to try to weed out any dangerous criminals in the underground? No! No! So what? You just expect me to believe that you had no idea who your parents were, only saw the front-facing view that Savannah gives the surface, and also decided that you should just send one little rocket out for a record? What happens in six months? Do you go back to your Black Ops house and casually drop some of the names of the people you met here offhandedly to someone who doesn't officially exist? Dane, stop it. I trusted you, Jules. I I trusted you more than anyone I've ever met in the last decade. And now I find out you've been right next to the people who are actively picking off our community this whole time. Dane, please. I love you more than anything. You know that. I thought I did, Jules. But I'm not really sure what to think right now. And I sure as hell can't do it with you right here in front of me. I'm going to go talk to Shuri. Maybe don't turn any more of us in if you can help it. So, it's not looking good. All the plans we had fell through. Literally every single one. 
So it's the backup plan for us, which I really wanted to avoid. My plan from the beginning was to use Sintel as a contact to get the fuel we needed, but that fell apart quickly. As fast as I sprinted away from that meeting, in fact. <sighs> oh well. I called a team meeting to let the gang know what our final option is. It's risky, so I want everyone on board. It needs all of us to pull off anyway. Kay will be in. Dane will hate it, but come around. I'm less sure about Armani, and I'm really worried if Jules will go for it. Risk is something I deal with a lot in my line of work, but Jules is, well, more sheltered. I've seen her grow a lot as we work on this project, though. Getting comfortable in the underground, getting better at lying to Savannah officers, dating my fucking brother too comfortable. I'm not surprised it's coming to this, though. It's been a shit year, and we've all learned to expect the worst. Damn it. I was hoping we could swing a trade so that I wouldn't have to organize a goddamn heist! (sighs) Well, here goes. Figured I'd record this for posterity so the record can show that I at least tried. Took you long enough. Shut up, Dane. What's up, Shuri? Everything okay? Everything is not okay. Oh, no. Yeah. So, you know how we were each going to look into alternative means of getting rocket fuel? Yeah? None of those worked. I even tried a few other options I never even mentioned. Talking to contacts I hadn't spoken to in years and calling in old favors, but... Nothing? Nothing. Fuck. We're fucked. How are we going to launch this? I mean, there's always... We are not going nuclear, okay? We've discussed this. Party pooper. There is still something on the table. Oh? You're not going to like it. Oh. How do y'all feel about breaking into a Savannah warehouse? You want to do what? Sure, what the heck? I said you weren't going to like it. I like it. You also like the idea of a nuclear rocket. I don't think you count. Fair. Just let me explain first. Before you shoot it down and we have to start a grass seed campaign. I'm pretty sure huge ass rockets are against their terms of service. Sorry. Go ahead. I have a fully detailed building plan of a Savannah warehouse. Floor plan, schematics, security routes, everything. I was scoping this place out because I heard they had some of the fuel we needed, and I wanted to see if I could convince Brady, uh, my contact who works there, to let me sneak in to smuggle some out. Okay, and? This warehouse has it. More than I thought they would. This single location contains enough fuel to launch three or four rockets of our scale. I mean, that's good, right? In some ways. But it's a hell of a lot easier to steal one or two canisters than an entire rocket's worth. I literally cannot carry the amount we'd need. Which means... We'd need to come with you. Yeah. I can convince my contact to get us into the building. It's just a matter of leaving the back door unlocked. But we'll need extra keycards and uniforms to get through the interior doors. Plus, a larger group is more likely to catch attention... So, the likelihood of getting caught is higher. I don't have a way to get extra keycards, I only have the one. So, Jules, I need you to use whatever ties you have with your parents and the company to get your hands on some. We need three more. I can handle extra uniforms, I know a guy. Kay, you'd be the getaway driver. I figure you can get a nondescript car that's faster than it looks and can fit everything we need. Armani, Dane, I need you to come with me. We'll be taking two carts full of the fuel, and it's heavy enough that we'll need to have two people pushing each cart, which means, Jules, you are not done when you get access cards. You have to come too. I know we've all been risking arrest, or worse, by doing this, but we'd be going into enemy territory and hoping to just walk out. That's the basic rundown, but there's a million and one details we'll have to go over if you're in. I can't understate the risk here, though. This was at the bottom of the list when it was just me going in there. 
It was plan fucking Z then, and now I'm gonna have to use the Greek alphabet. This is now plan Omega. We can still do this. It's not gonna be easy, but we've reached the last resort if we want to launch this thing. What do you think? <sighs> fuck it, <gasps> I'm in. Oh shit, Jewel said the fuck word. This episode was written by Brad Colbrook, Chandler Harrison, Cole Burkhart, D. Reese, and Talmanier, with script editing by Evan Tess Murray. It was directed by Cole Burkhart and Talmanier, and sound designed by Nico Goldstein, and features Jonah Loon as Jules, Vico Ortiz as Kay, Kathy Youssef as Armani, John Y. Kamara as Dane, and Sahar Iman as Shuri. The theme music is by Benny James, and the transcript is by Caroline Minks. What Will Be Here is primarily produced in Long Beach, on the stolen land of the Quiche Nation. Who's the discovery? How do you read?